How do our observations of the social context impact our perceptions of others? Recall that social perception starts with the perceiver who makes observations of the target. They are considered the target because they are the focus of our social perception. For this reason, social psychologists consider observations to be the basic elements of the whole process. The raw data we observe includes the target's personal characteristics, their behaviors, and cues from the environment. We'll cover each of these factors in this part of the lecture. Based on these thin slices of information, we either make a snap judgment about the target, or we take the time to make attributions about their disposition. Let's start with the target's personal characteristics, like their physical appearance, name, and facial features, to name a few. When we first meet someone, we use this information to make inferences about their traits and behaviors. Physical appearance is often the first thing we notice about other people, their perceived gender, age, race, ethnicity, and ability, their height, weight, hair color, piercings, and tattoos, and the list goes on. Based on the stereotypes we hold, we make inferences about the target person. For example, in the U.S., we tend to associate youthfulness with ability and associate the elderly with this ability. When we meet people who are younger, our brains assume they have a lot of abilities. They can work hard, they can stay up late, and they can party all weekend. When we meet people who are older, we infer that they can't do any of these things. But our assumptions can be, and often are, inaccurate. The target's name can also impact our inferences. For example, we tend to infer that women with a stereotypically masculine name, like Blake or Ryan, are more masculine than women with a stereotypically feminine name, like Olivia or Lindsay. Another example is that when people share the same name as us, we tend to infer that they share our traits and behaviors, in part because we associate our name with those characteristics. Even the target's facial features can impact the inferences we draw about them. We tend to infer that adults with a so-called baby face are more innocent, childlike, and dependent than mature-faced adults. One explanation proposed by researchers is that we associate babies with helplessness and then generalize this association to adults who have childlike facial features. We also observe their behaviors to identify their emotions and make inferences about their inner emotional state. Not only do we pay attention to what they say, but we also observe their nonverbal behaviors. These are the behaviors that reveal a person's feelings without using words. Instead, the message is communicated through facial expressions, eye gaze, vocal cues, body language, and physical touch. For example, Todorov and colleagues found that participants associated certain facial expressions with certain qualities. They found that people with a U-shaped mouth and raised eyebrows were perceived to be more trustworthy than people with other expressions. In the early 2000s, Elfin Bean and Am Beatty studied the universality and cultural specificity of emotion recognition. They asked people from all over the world to look at photos of facial expressions and identify the emotion being expressed. The results are shown here. Their study suggests that across cultures, people are able to accurately identify six primary emotions from others' facial expressions. Happiness, sadness, surprise, anger, fear, and disgust. Note that we are best at identifying the emotion of happiness from facial expressions. In other words, a smile means the same thing in the U.S. as it does in the rest of the world. In the mid-1800s, Charles Darwin applied his theory of natural selection to his study of emotions. Like modern researchers, he also found evidence of the universality of emotions. He said human feelings are an ancient form of communication, and the ability to recognize other people's emotions has survival value. It helps us adapt to our environment and live a long life. Let's consider a few examples. The ability to recognize happiness allows us to relax in the absence of danger. Fearful faces help us avoid dangerous animals and risky activities. Looks of disgust can help us avoid food poisoning and rotting carcasses. And the ability to recognize anger can help us avoid conflict, fights, and violence. More recently, social psychologists have found additional evidence to support Darwin's ideas. 
We are prone to the anger superiority effect, for instance, meaning we can more quickly identify an angry face in a crowd of people than a happy or neutral face. However, cultures vary in their nonverbal behavior norms. Cross-cultural research on the perception of emotion, like the study by Elfenbein and Ann Beatty, suggests we are better at judging the emotions of people who share our culture than of those from other cultures. This creates what they call an in-group accuracy advantage. The target's eye gaze is another non-verbal behavior we use to make inferences about their emotional state. For instance, if they are prone to gaze disengagement or lack of eye contact, we tend to form a negative impression of them. So, just as you've probably been told many times, maintaining eye contact is important to our social interactions. We also observe the target's behaviors to decide whether they are lying or telling the truth. However, humans are not great lie detectors. An overwhelming amount of scientific data indicates that we have about a 50% chance of correctly identifying whether someone is lying to us. For context, a polygraph has a 70% accuracy rate, even with an expert administrator. One of the reasons we are poor lie detectors is because we pay attention to the wrong variables. Many people pay attention to the target's words, eyes, and facial expressions. But these features are easy for deceivers to control. The research suggests that the best way to determine if someone is lying is to pay attention to the content of their lies, changes in their voice pitch, and their body movements. These features are harder to control and serve as better cues than those we typically attend to. The third piece of raw data we pay attention to is situational cues. We each have scripts or preconceived notions about certain situations that help us to anticipate goals, behaviors, and probable outcomes. Consider what it means to eat at a restaurant. For many of us, we drive there, park, enter, or wait to be seated, sit, order, drink, eat, pay, exit, and drive home. But for some people, they don't drive. They walk, take public transportation, or use a ride-sharing service. Other people may be more familiar with fast food restaurants where they simply drive through and order their meals. These scripts shape our observations and inferences in many ways. Most of the time, they help us make predictions about what to expect and how to behave. Sometimes they lead us to see what we expect to see, instead of what is actually there. Other times they lead us to make inferences about a target we didn't directly observe using our knowledge of the situation. The more experience we have in a specific situation, the more detail our script will be. In the 1980s, Pryor and Relusi studied the recall of dating scripts. The script for a first date was more easily recalled and described by participants with extensive dating experience. In the 1900s, Psychologists discovered that cognitive scripts are culture-specific, specific to a culture. In other words, the same behavior can be perceived differently in different cultures. Consider national culture. What is acceptable for a first date in the U.S. may not be acceptable in another country. Also consider age culture. What is acceptable for a first date in high school may be different from what is acceptable for a middle-aged person like myself. Finally, Consider gender culture. In the U.S., what is expected of women on a first date is different from what is expected of men. Next, you are going to learn about the attribution process, how we transform our observations of the raw data into a judgment about their disposition.